let me give two about three words about myself. Um, I like to play just like all the rest of us. And I'm a gadget guy, but gadgeting alone isn't enough. Uh, from as early as I can remember, I annoyed the hell out of people by asking why. And when DSTAR and DMR and the other digital modes got dropped in my lap, I wanted to know a lot more than, you know, you can program your radio and you can talk on it. Right? Sure, I know that, but what's it doing? And that led me to experiment and ran into a lot of people who were also experimenters. It brought me in contact with the group that was experimenting running HF over DSTAR. And the first thing I did was kind of go, well, this is really cool. I mean, this, this goes back to when I was in the service. I remember we had some rudimentary digital stuff that was used for scrambling voice, but wow, has it ever come forward? And now we've got consumer products we can buy. Anyway, so that, that's sort of what led me into this. And it, it, it's totally out of character uh, from my real life, which is as a dentist, uh, a research scientist, and um, later on I was a biotech executive, but that's another story. We'll leave it there. Um, ham radio became a love. Uh, as I was getting out of the service, I couldn't stand not having my hands on various pieces of equipment. And the only way I could do that while I was going through dental school was to get my ham license, and I did that. Okay. Um, so basically what I'm going to try to do for you is give you an idea of the history of, you know, where, where this whole crazy idea come from. Uh, for those of you who are not really familiar with digital radio and some of the bits and pieces behind it, I'm going to give you a little basic uh, technical background, talk about hardware some, and then talk about the HFD start parts of things and, and operations. So, you know, the big thing, what's this HFD star? This is crazy. What, what do we need that for? You know, we got CW, we got sideband, we got AM, we got whatever you want to do. It, it, you know, there's lots of different ways of using HF, and that's just the point. We're amateur radio operators, we're experimenters, and we like to doodle, and that's what took us here. No repeaters, no internet remember that that's really important it's an important point here because a lot of people don't understand or have never bothered to look beyond what they see when somebody throws well gee whiz here's a d star or here's c4 fm oh i need to talk to my local repeater that's set up that way and that'll get me hooked up every well no you don't need to do that uh, it, it's more than that, and it's less than that. It's a lot of fun. Uh, so along with that will come the background and history of what we're doing, and I'll talk a little about the legal basis, uh, why we can do this, with these star in particular. Um, basic uh, tech concepts will include just talking about the, the D-Star packet itself. Uh, how does it behave in the real world, uh, comparing that to FM or sideband? Um, and then I'm going to go into UHF and VHF versus HF propagations effects on DSTAR. And that's really important because, as you'll hear me say, while it's a lot of fun, it also can be very frustrating. Um, why does it work over HF? How reliable is it over HF? Uh, I'm going to answer a whole bunch of common misconceptions that folks have about what we do. Uh, talk a little about the current hardware, as I said, and then I'll go over the net and what we do when we're doing the HFD star net. And there's a whole uh, setup that will provide uh, Elmering and uh, a place to go to uh, uh, play. 
And then I'll do a very brief demonstration at the end. Uh, it will not be a live communications. It's a recording of uh, uh, some contacts I made between where I live here in Northern Maryland and a good friend of mine who is in West Palm Beach, Florida. Okay, uh, let's move along. So what is all this about HFD Star? What we think we know is that DV, digital voice over radio, can do all this, but it really, re it, 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 it relies entirely on the backbone. And the backbone would be repeaters, internet, reflectors, internet, more repeaters, all interconnected and doing its job. Well, yeah, that's true, but HF, really? Yeah, yeah, really. It is just like running Simplex in any other mode. If you have two pieces of the same kind of equipment, sideband, FM, whatever, you can talk to each other. You don't need any of that stuff. The delightful thing about HFD star or HFDV of any kind is that you get crystal clear voice quality, even when the propagation conditions aren't wonderful, up to the point where things fall apart. And I'll talk about that. So let's go a little into the history. A lot of you guys probably know this, but I think it's good for those who don't that I touch on some of it so you know where I'm coming from and what I want you to keep in mind as we go forward through the uh, presentation. Uh, DSTAR actually stands for something, Digital Smart Technologies for Amateur Radio. It's the brainchild of a bunch of engineers in the JARL, and they were actually funded by the Japanese Telecommunications Agency folks to um, come up with a digital transport system for amateur radio. They funded, started in the late 90s. Uh, when they hatched it, it was about 2000, 2001. Um, it is an open spec transport system. People hear all the time that D-STAR is proprietary, only ICOM does it, yada, yada. It's not true. D-STAR, the only proprietary part of any digital radio system is the AMBI encoder chip, which is made by DVSI. Every single system I'm aware of uses an encoder chip, and most of them use the AMBI encoder chip. ICOM and the JARL people, when they designed this, chose the AMBI chip, an early version of it, because it was the best embedded system out there at the time. And it actually remains the dominant system in digital radio. There are other projects going on that are bringing forward uh, some digital encoding systems, the Codec 2 project, the M17 project, that sort of thing. Uh, really not going to address those, but those are true open source projects. And uh, maybe five, ten years down the road, there'll be commercial products based on those. But right at the moment, uh, a bunch of very, very smart engineer amateur radio operators are having fun programming this stuff up and getting it to work. All right. So ICOM adopted the protocol and they commercialized it. That spec is open. And it's been great because folks like Jonathan uh, G4KLX, who is the guy who basically hatched what became uh, the core of MMDVM, uh, that's the little uh, software chunk that does the multi-mode transporting of digital voice for us. Jonathan, Jonathan relied on that open spec to do what he did. So it's really important. So more recently, Kenwood uh, JVC folks at Flex Radio have uh, been able to incorporate DSTAR capability into some of their products. But 
the interesting point here is that any radio with a 9600 baud data bit per second data port, excuse me, and an ambi based digitizer are fully compatible with DV. You can take any radio that has one of those and with the right piece of hardware and software on the outside, get it to transmit D star, DMR, whatever. Um, it is uh, one of the nice things about the equipment we have. It's designed to be experimented with. Okay. Some of our net members are using those homebrew D star systems, uh, most notably uh, Stu, uh, WI3J, who's down uh, south of me about 40 miles in Gaithersburg, uh, Maryland, uh, is using a Yezu transceiver and a starboard, which was one of the pieces of hardware that uh, was made available to do this, uh, and a uh, ambi chip that plugs into a computer. He can run that thing, and I wouldn't know talking to him that he was on a Yezu unless he told me. And it works beautifully, and it works beautifully over both um, repeaters and over HF. So it's a bunch of fun. Okay. Um, like I said, Flex has done something. The 6000 series uh, SDR transceiver. Uh, you can you can get a thumb drive type ambi encoder chip system uh, from Northwest Digital or from uh, the folks over in uh, the Netherlands. Uh, the uh, uh, folks that make the uh, ah, one of one of the hotspots anyway. Uh, have these available. It's uh, something you can get from any one of the uh, major dealers around. Um, you can use that and uh, it works very well. Uh, kind of cool with the, rice, or the reason price drops that have taken place because of age, I guess, and the uh, penetration of the market. The IC7100 has become very popular. Uh, it's a great entry radio, second radio for a lot of people. Folks have put those in, in, in their mobiles. Uh, they've got them as backup radios, emergency radios, all kinds of stuff. And built into that is the entire D-Star encoding and decoding system. And folks with the 7100, new users have discovered it and you know, gone, what can I do with this here? I've got an HF radio, capable radio that can do it. So they've joined in. And then uh, the very surprisingly popular 705 uh, QRP radio has brought a whole bunch of, of brand new users in who are also interested in D Star. So it, it, it's it's a great uh, you know it, it, it's a it, you have a great range of equipment that's available to you. So how did this all come to be? Well, in 2011, um, ICOM introduced their first multi-band, you know, uh, basically audio to daylight transceiver, the 9100. Um, a couple of guys, Larry, WW6USA, and Mark, KJ4VO, discovered that their radios would actually transmit on HF. And they got talking to each other and began testing and discovered that indeed when the conditions are right, these star signals behave just fine on HF. And they began using one of the reflect, one of the D star reflectors, uh, REF30 Charlie to coordinate what frequencies they were gonna use to test on. Well, Kent KQ4KK who's down in South Carolina and several other users uh, heard this going on they had 9100s and they joined in. And that's how the net really got started. Uh, it's been going strong since 2011. Uh, I got interested in this a few years back, uh, happened to have a 7100 and joined in the, 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 the merry uh, mayhem that we uh, create. Um, interestingly, when conditions are right, uh, we've had openings that have allowed us to have 
uh, folks from New Zealand, Australia, uh, South Africa, and uh, South America join in. So it's really, really interesting when this, uh, when a band's open, uh, you know, the, the world is available, so to speak. Uh, just a couple of basic tech comments here that I think are really important to bring bring forward. What what is this packet? This this D Star packet. How how is it put together? Well, it is a chunk of data. Part of that data is the audio payload itself, but there are syncing frames, headers, all the other things that go along with the data packet being transmitted. What's kind of cool about DSTAR is the way they designed it, is they designed in a total of 1,200 bits for FEC data, which allows some error correction, um, 1,200 free as a data channel, with the remainder there, the 2,400, uh, for the voice data channel. And what I've done is a little schematic next to a uh, waterfall tracing from HF so you could kind of see what DSTAR looks like on the waterfall. Um, it, it, it usually has a very smooth appearance, uh, but you notice there's some lines here and I'll explain those in just a minute. But DSTAR is not using just FM, what it is is GMSK, Gaussian minimum shift keying. Technical wonks will want to know what that is. Don't ask me to explain it. I'm not that smart, at least not about that. Uh, so that minimum shift keying signal is put out of the NV chip, streamed uh, through the modem and onto an FM type signal, but that's what it looks like. That signal is 6.25 kilohertz wide. So it's no wider than, F uh, than AM. All right. The cool thing about it is that it is much less susceptible to the effects of signal fading, signal amplitude changes. Much less than AM, SSB, or FM. So as long as the signal is being received and it's coming in with the data intact, it works. You get a nice voice signal until the signal drops off a cliff. Things begin to break up. First, you begin to get sort of nonsense syllables and noise. You'll hear digital radio users talk about R2D2 that's the noise that you're hearing when that happens. Um, when it finally gets to the point that the software can't do anything with it anymore, it goes away and you have dead silence. So as a, 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 as a result, and you'll, you'll hear this when we play the uh, uh, recording a little later on, when you're listening to, to sideband, you're used to a lot of background noise. When you're listening to D-Star over HF, there is no noise until you receive a signal. And it's kind of hard to get to used to, but uh, it's fun. The first time it happens, it literally startles you because there's nothing there and then all of a sudden somebody's sitting in the shack with you talking. Okay, signal multipath, which occurs on HF, will degrade the decode. And that's the, the, that's the Achilles heel of, of, of D-Star or any digital mode. Uh, and I'll talk a little more about that. Um, that bit error rate that is introduced by a um, distorted GMSK signal is what causes the breakup and then the loss of signal. So what I've done here over on the right side of the uh, screen, these slides, uh, I have next to each other a typical UHF. It's one I transmitted, so it's very, very uh, high amplitude.
but it, it shows you the shape you would expect uh, on your uh, frequency curve as well as your um, uh, waterfall. That's pretty much what it looks like, is that, that center bar. Uh, you can see little sidebars um, if you have a very, very strong signal. On HF, when you're using the ionosphere, the ionosphere is not like a, a, a mirror. It's, it's got ripples, and those ripples cause multipath reflection to occur. Sometimes pieces of the signal will cancel other pieces of the signal out, and that's why you see these lines running through these signals. I recorded those during a session where we were carrying on uh, a QSO uh, over D star HF. Uh, this uh, presentation has a number of embedded uh, H, uh, HTML um, links. Uh, all of them run to more technical data. I, I wrote a, um, a, a little wiki article about this phenomena and explain how it, it, it occurs, if you belong to Groups I.O., go to the HFD Star group. Uh, in, in our wiki section, you'll find my, uh, my uh, um, little white paper. Uh, if you click on this, it'll take you directly to it, so you can do it either way. Okay, so what's going on here? Uh, nothing magic, really. <laughs> I used that on purpose just to point out that it's not. The only difference between DV and analog is this step right here. That's coding voice into data, okay? And you're just feeding it into a modulator system, transmitting it, receiving, detecting, demodulating, and then decoding that digital stream and then listening to the audio output, okay? And again, I, I, I'm just pointing out why there's a difference. Audio signals uh, can decre uh, degrade, excuse me, degrade as reception degrades in standard methods. The analog signal, excuse me, uh, uh, digital signals don't degrade until the whole system is beginning to fail because the signal is so weak. DV doesn't care. If it's, the data is there, it'll give you full strength, full quality voice. Okay. For those of you who are not really familiar with the traditional D-Star system, using the internet, using repeaters and reflectors, uh, Toshin, KE0FHS, did a beautiful job of explaining this. And I'm not gonna go into this at all. Uh, I, I put this slide in more for reference. Uh, if you are interested in any type of digital radio, go to his website and read his primer. It is beautifully written, beautifully thought out, very logical and easy to follow. One point that I wanna make is because traditional DV uses the internet and uses reflectors, you can just use a piece of software on your computer in an ambi chip and you can talk through the reflector system. There's a piece of software called BlueDV and if you go to this link here, um, PA7LIM is the author of, of that particular software, several other pieces of software that are wonderful. Uh, very, very nice way to get in at low cost. Get yourself one of the Ambi dongles, download the software, which is free, and uh, with a little configuration, you're up and running on DMR, D-Star, System Fusion. Uh, they, they're, they're all available using his software, and it's a really nice, uh, nicely done piece of, of, of software. Okay. Let me go briefly into some of the uh, misconceptions that, that, that I've had to answer time and time again. Uh, 
DV, oh my gosh, it's going to jam up the hand bands. It's real broad. It's, it's going to be all over everything and in the way. No, this isn't true. Uh, no more than AM, certainly. And actually, the number of 10 kilohertz wide AM signals I see on, uh, that, that's uh, arguably probably causing more problems. How many overdriven SSB signals have you seen that occupy more than about uh, uh, 29 or 30, uh, or, you know, th th three kilohertz? Um, SSTV, same thing. Um, and some of the wide digital modes. I mean, you know, they're all they're they're all guilty of being greater than a sideband signal. <laughs> so. Uh, I just point out again here, this is half the bandwidth of FM. It's, it's 6.25 kilohertz wide. Uh, fits in with what you can use legally. Okay, another misconcept, and I've heard this a lot of times from people. Oh, it's gotta be illegal. You can't use data in a voice segment. Well, this is not just data, and the FCC has been very clear about that. Digital voice is considered a voice mode. And you can take a look at the FCC rules, part 97.3, section C, section five, and it's legal and considered a, 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 a voice mode in all voice bands that are available to amateur radio. Now, apparently in Japan and some other countries for other reasons, DV cannot be used below 29 megahertz, but most countries do permit it. And uh, we've taken advantage of that to do some nice DXing when the bands are open. Isn't DSTAR proprietary to ICOM? Well, I answered that already. It's not. The only completely proprietary bit of this is their use of DVSI's AMBI chip and their own intellectual property in the in in, in the their their trademarking and their uh, hardware, but there's nothing to keep other people from adopting the same thing and using the same AMBI mode with the same transport capability because the transport mechanism is open source. Okay, just remember all of these modes that I've listed here all use that DVSI AMBI codec either embedded in software in the radio or in the form of the DVSI AMBI chip. That's the transport layer that makes all these work, and it's also what makes them different from each other. Okay, a couple more things that people run into. And this is the really weird thing. People look at these radios and they go, well, my all-band radio does not do D-Star on HF because there are no repeaters or reflectors on HF. Well, no, but it does simplex, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay. All of these radios, the, the 7100, 9100, 705, and any of those HF radios which have the appropriate external hardware can work just fine with simplex uh, D-Star, and they, and they do it very nicely. Okay. Um, what about other DV modes? Well, I, I mentioned briefly two projects. The, the, the Codec 2 project is a piece of software that you can download and you, you need to, to play games in order to get it working properly. But you can get it set up on a Windows box and it works very nicely. It also is available on other platforms. Um, this website will take you there. Uh, it is part of the Codec 2 project, and Codec 2 is a very nice um, encoding spec that does provide some very, very narrow band um, digital voice data streams. Uh, so it doesn't need to occupy as much space as DSTAR does. It has some advantages because of that, but it hasn't been widely adopted because it's kind of difficult to, to, to configure. I have not tried C4FM. It might work. Uh, I don't know. It's not a time-slotted DV mode like DMR, 
uh, the bandwidth is likely too wide. And I honestly don't know enough about uh, C4FM to tell you what its wide mode and its narrow modes are. But I, if I recall correctly, it's about 12.5 kilohertz wide in their narrow mode. Um, there may still have been some experiments with the FT991 transceiver because that is uh, C4FM um, capable. I haven't tried DMR. T2, uh, DMR tier two will definitely not work. Uh, it first of all is too wide, and it, it requires a time division multiple. I'm sorry, time division multiplex capable hardware. And if you've ever watched a DMR signal on an oscilloscope or uh, other uh, visual device, you'll know that it does very rapid pulsing. So it is pulsing on and off and listening in between the pulses. Uh, I don't know of a piece of HF gear that would handle that very well. It probably would not. Um, tier one doesn't do that. Uh, it might work, uh, but I'm not aware of any capable radios. So I, I, I don't think anybody's ever tried it. Okay, I've talked about this before, uh, just to make the point clear. The 7100 and the 705 from ICOM are out of the box ready to go. Everything's there. You can literally plug it in. You can tune to an HF frequency, one that we use, hit the mode button, go to DV, and you're there. You don't need to register, you don't need anything. You just do it. Uh, the 9100 needed the D-Star module, which was an AMB chip uh, on a carrier card with some other code and stuff involved. Uh, once you have that module, it just works. Uh, I, I don't know how many of the 9100s out there have the D-Star modules in them. I know that not all do. So make sure if you're coming on one and you want to potentially use D-Star that it has that UT-121 module in it. Um, the Flex Radio 6000 signature series, you need to get a thumb DV um, and you need to use the, and I forget the Flex term for it, but it's a, a piece of software that you can use uh, to deal with different code, uh, uh, encoded audio types. Um, there is a timing defect in the version that's out there. Uh, hopefully they're going to address it. Uh, it causes some problems with using it on a repeater, but doesn't impact Simplex D-Star. So we've had quite a number of Flex users who, who have this system set up uh, successfully. And that little piece of software you need for your Flex, I believe, I believe it's posted on the HF D-Star uh, website. Um, and then I mentioned any HF, VHF, UHF radio with a 9600 baud uh, modem port. That, that, that ought to work just fine. You, you'll need a GMSK modem of some sort uh, and a computer uh, with an AMBI device. Uh, and there are several commercial things out there that are uh, available that you can put this together. But that is an experimenter's project. Um, so again, if you really want to dive deep in this stuff, that's, that's a, a game you might consider playing. Okay, let me go over operations real quick and then we'll do our uh, demonstration. We coordinate our activities and we have two ways of doing it. First of all, uh, there is a website and uh, John, K7VE of Northwest Digital was kind enough to put this up for us. Uh, he has another site that's dedicated to the um, uh, Codec 2 FreeDV project uh, that has a similar um, URL. Uh, this is a chat style website that has extra information on it about the frequency, frequencies that we use. And you'll see when I talk about the, the way that the net is structured, uh, how we coordinate what we do. Um, that website plus the um, reflector uh, 03030, uh, and actually this is a typo, we use Charlie, not Alpha, um, is active 
uh, on uh, Saturdays at 7 Eastern, so 1900, uh, 10 o'clock in the morning Sunday Eastern time, and uh, 1900 uh, again on Sunday. So three times during the weekend. It's great practice. If you have a D-Star capable HF radio, uh, you can follow along at this website. You'll know the, you'll, they'll announce the signals or the, the frequencies we're going to be transmitting on, and you can hear us exchange, uh, try to exchange um, uh, contacts with each other on that, uh, during that net. It's great practice, and if you have two D-Star radios, you can listen to RAF 30 Charlie at the same time that you're listening to uh, the uh, actual activity on HF. Now, during the COVID crisis, there's uh, been a group of us that are shut in. I, I work from home anyway, but uh, about two o'clock Eastern every day, uh, we get on, we use the website, but don't use the uh, reflector. And uh, we're usually on for about a half hour or so. Um, since it's just simplex, it's kind of cool. You can do this at field day, station to station. There's no multiply and mu multiplier extra credit for it, but you know it's one of those things that's fun to try, and you can put it in your uh, report. I did it. We we did uh, HF digital back and forth. Okay, so like I said, we can do this without any of that infrastructure. You don't even need a D-Star registration. Uh, as you would from the U.S. Trust in order to use the REF reflector system. You just need the hardware and a good antenna. It works beautifully line of sight, just like you would expect, simplex VHF or UHF. Um, you've got line of sight communications on HF. You can't tell the difference and the clarity and quality is beautiful. It's reasonable to good with NVIS if you have the right INS layers and, and they're behaving themselves uh, just like standard NVIS. It can, again, uh, with extra clarity and, and for a uh, potentially for MCOM use, that sort of thing, it might be uh, very, very useful because you can have digital messaging on that off channel going at the same time that you uh, are talking and it's simultaneous. Um, our regional HF contacts are fairly solid and they were pretty solid through the down, the, the down slope of the, the uh, uh, sunspot cycle. And now that things are coming up, they're getting better, but we pretty much can do anything we need with 20, 40 and 80 time of day depending. And then the other bands join in as the MUF uh, it gets better. Uh, when the bands open, uh, it's worldwide DX. And it's a hoot to talk to EU hams, VKs, and ZLs have uh, joined in as well. So it's been a lot of fun. Unfortunately, aurora and unsettled solar conditions can make propagation uh, really unpredictable. And I showed you an example of that. And, uh, yeah, I've, I've really enjoyed DXing D-Star. Uh, it's fun because it's a challenge. You know, it's like QRP. It, <laughs> you either love it or you hate it. You know, if, if all you want to do is talk, this isn't necessarily a mode you want to try. But this is an experimental thing that you can have a lot of fun with. And I think uh, some of the younger folks who are getting into the hobby are really intrigued by this. And, and that's kind of the cool thing about it. Okay, setting up a D-Star radio to do this is easy. I've put the slide in here uh, more for later. Um, anybody who wants to try to do this and join in, this is how I programmed my 7100. Uh, I've got it in my band B uh, memory group. Um, these are the frequencies that we use uh, on the net. And as you can see, it's simplex DV. And the only thing that you need is the your call sign has to be, that's the other call sign you're talking to, has to be the general call, which is CQ, CQ, CQ. Okay. All of the rest of this doesn't matter. And I've got some notes down here that might help you. But 
you know, if you have one of these radios, give it a try. Maybe, maybe join in and let us know that you're uh, listening by using the website or uh, actually try to transmit and have some fun. Okay, this is how we structure the net. And I, I, I'm going to not go over everything here. Most of this is pretty obvious. I gave you the schedule earlier and it's repeated here, but um, we usually start on a Saturday evening or Sunday evening on six meters and we go up. We take about this long on each of the bands. If a band is open and I've been on when six meter openings have occurred, 10 meter openings have occurred, we may stay there for 10 minutes, okay? But this is the general way it's run. We don't like to occupy uh, REF 30 Charlie uh, for very long. Uh, we may be off of these frequencies a little bit because of local uh, cue says that we don't want a QRM. But these are the base frequencies that we start with. And uh, the net control on 30 Charlie will uh, direct you to the alternative on each of these bands if we need to pick one. Uh, for practice and to sort of get tuned up, we have uh, 30 minutes before these nets start. Uh, we have a, a, a pre-net on, on 20 meters, and that's a place where you can set up your equipment and see if you're actually copying anybody. Uh, it could be frustrating. You may not hear anything. On the other hand, uh, if conditions are right and one of our signals is getting into your area well, uh, you'll be able to do that. Bunch of fun. Okay, on this slide, I'm going to sort of do my mini demonstration here. Uh, the slide um, kind of explains what I'm doing, but I started with a recording. I was talking to a good friend of mine in South Florida. Uh, you'll, you'll hear him, K, K, KG4CWC. And um, uh, Bob and I are exchanging. First, I start with sideband noise so you can remember what that sounds like. Then I'm going to switch over to D star voice, and then I'm going to switch back to sideband and Bob and I are going to wrap up our QSO on sideband. And um, again, you may see some or hear or some selective fade effects that are caused by multipath, although there wasn't very much that day. It was really a, 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 good, uh, a good situation. Um, hopefully you'll be able to hear this well. Uh, I've done it as loudly as I can and it don't know whether it patches the right way, but we'll give it a try. Yeah, that's definitely sounding really good now. A good, good pipeline between West Palm Beach and Maryland. It's uh, sounding real clear. Okay, well, I think that's enough audio for the demo, and uh, I'll uh, clean it up and put it in a little uh, compressed script for the uh, presentation tonight. KG4CWC, KD4IZ, thank you. I'm 7 3 on the radio. I'm going to talk to you on the phone. All right, Jack. KG4CWC, clear with KD4IZ, 7 3. <laughs> significant amount of fade going on right now, Bob, and that's uh, it's certainly affecting Steve on this end of it. KD4CWC, KD4 as it. So that was kind of fun. You, you got to hear the difference between it. Hopefully, everybody heard that well. Um, can I get a thumbs up from folks that could hear that okay? Excellent. 
Excellent. So you really can tell the difference. And it's, it's startling uh, when you hear it the first time, like I said. You may have noticed on the second um, over, uh, while Bob was talking to me, he had his uh, cell phone connected. And so we were getting echo back through his cell phone. And I won't go back and replay that, but that's one of the oddities of D-Star or any other DV. There is some lag uh, in the encoding and decoding that takes place. There's also lag in the digital voice encoding and decoding that takes place on cell phones. So there was a double delay there, and that's why it sounded weird and kind of echoey if you heard that. Okay, um, I've added this in here mostly as a post um, uh, presentation uh, set of references for you, uh, where some of the things are. Uh, I'm going to provide um, Dan uh, with a, a copy of this um, presentation in Adobe Acrobat uh, form. And you should be able to click on any of these references and go directly to those websites when you open the uh, Adobe um, Acrobat uh, file on your computer. But this is just additional information that may be helpful. Uh, one thing I did want to point out, uh, Daryl Stout, WX4QZ, keeps an extensive list of, of nets, not just for DSTAR, but all digital modes, and also on Echolink and a few other uh, bits and pieces of stuff that he's interested in. But he's got a great, uh, a great setup here. Uh, take a look at his website, and uh, you can download the uh, spreadsheet for your time zone for all of the nets that he keeps track of. Um, there are a couple of DV development groups, the MMDVM HS hat group. These are the folks that, that came up with the, uh, what became the Zoom spot or the MMDVM China spot. There's lots of different uh, hotspots, uh, but this is the software development group that put all of that together. Um, the G4KLX uh, software repository if you want to play and hack, is found here uh, at this website. So that's my presentation. Be happy to uh, take some questions if you have some. Um, and I'm going to turn that now back over um, to Dan and let him down here. OK, well, thank you, Jack. Appreciate that. Are there any questions at this point? I see some over here. Barry, you want to catch the questions? It's in the text. Hello, Barry. Okay, I'm ready when you are. What is the oh. emissions designator for D Star? If there I is. Don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right off the top of my head, I don't know. I would have to look it up. I have done it in the past, but it's not something I keep track of. Okay. <laughs> I'll get to that. In practice, people usually stick to 100 watts. Are your D-Star HF users use higher wattage? Uh, we have used higher. Some of us do use higher wattage. I tend to do it as, as the minimum wattage that gets me through. Um, I rarely go above about 250 because I don't want to push my amplifier hard. This is a digital mode. So some of the issues you run into there are the same issues you would run into, say, with FT8 or PSK. Uh, if you run the uh, system wide open, you're going to heat things up and hurt your, uh, hurt your equipment or your antenna. The ARRL's considerable, considerate operator guide indicates that 14236 is the digital voice frequency. Did that come about after the HFD star net became a thing? I don't know. Uh, I, I wasn't around at the time those decisions were made. Um, 
326 is used occasionally, but we've tended to go higher up. Uh, I think you saw that frequency chart that we had. Um, it, it tends to be 14330, and we find a hole where nobody's uh, can hear us and we can't hear anybody use it that way. Um, I, I think the considerate operator, again, is going to listen so they're not QRMing anybody. And we are sensitive to that because uh, it's an unusual mode. Um, if you listen to D-star transmissions using a sideband or an AM transceiver, you're going to hear something very odd. It's going to sound like a chirp followed by a whooshing noise. I don't know if you've ever listened to any uh, digital, um, like, like uh, DRM type uh, transmitters with a analog transceiver or receiver, but you would have very similar sound. It's a, a loud whooshing noise, um, but it starts off with a chirp and that's the sync tones um, being transmitted. So the way I describe it is, is a chirp whoosh. Go ahead. Okay. Do ICOM radios have a way to indicate there's an existing analog activity when in DV mode so that one doesn't accidentally transmit over a QSO in progress? Yes, it, they do. Uh, the, the, newer, the newer one, the, the 705, of course, has a uh, spectrum scope. And I use that spectrum scope uh, extensively. Uh, what I chose to do with the 7100, because the spectrum scope built into that is sort of rudimentary and not really useful, is I do two things. First of all, whenever I move to a frequency, I flip into sideband, and I listen up and down from that frequency some to see if there's any, uh, anything going on. I'll often flip sidebands to see if the offside of the channel is busy. So I'll go from upper sideband to lower sideband on 20 meters first before transmitting. Um, there is a, uh, a, a, a status light that lights up. And when a signal is detected, even if it's not being decoded, it will light off uh, if, if the right tones are pro uh, present. And very frequently in a voice sideband signal, Particular. Some of those tones are there, and so the, the light will flicker and do some odd dances for you to let you know you're stepping on somebody. Um, what I do here at home with the 7100 is I use uh, an SDR, and I have an SDR switch that uh, basically is like an antenna switch, and it allows me to transmit without blowing my SDR up, but I can watch the entire spectrum on the SDR and make sure that we're not on top of anybody. Um, Kent, myself, uh, several other real active members of the net use that technique all the time. And uh, we kind of direct other people not to, not to step in or if somebody decides to come up on frequency, uh, I let them know that we move to somewhere else where it's not busy. Okay, so does that also work on non-SDR radios if you don't have an SDR radio? Uh, uh, in in what way? I mean, if you had a seventy three hundred, you could, for instance, or a, or a, um, one of the newer Yezu radios with or, or or Kenwood radios with a really nice uh, SDR type display on it, waterfall. Yeah, you can see it very well. And and once you get used to looking for various signal types, uh, you actually I think become a better operator. Okay. How does HFD star work in a net setting where multiple users are communicating? It's a mess. <laughs> because, you know, you can't, you can't transmit on top of each other. And if two people are transmitting at the same time, they, they tend to cause some uh, cancellation of signal, which means nobody's going to get a decode. So there's, a, there's an art to carrying on a conversation. And if you're in a a football scrum, if you will. Uh, toes do get stepped on, but we tend to leave a space and listen. That way, folks don't tend to double up as much. 
Does that make sense? Yes, that makes sense. It's just operating style. Yeah. Okay. If someone posted the designator for DSTAR on HF, and I'm not going to read it. If anyone's interested, they can look at the chat transcript later. But it's, I'll just read it real quick. 6K25F7W. There you go. That sounds right. 6K25 okay. gives you the frequency width. Okay, great. Uh, F7W has to be the GMSK over FM. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And uh, Brian in Illinois wanted to say if he understood it with the proper dongle and available open source software, any HF radio can be D star capable. Is that correct? It is correct if you have a 9600 baud data port on the radio. Okay. So, for instance, all of the FT8X7 transceivers have that little mini DIN data port on the back. Uh, this, the ICOM 706, the ICOM 7000, and the 7100 all have that mini DIN data port. Uh, some of the newer radios have other ways of getting into the transmit chain at the right place. Uh, through their data ports or their um, signal ports. And apparently you can do it that way. I, I just have not educated myself to that yet. K9 KQA says you can purchase a USB dongle that includes the voice chip and then run Blue DV free software on Windows to access the chip and then do DMR D star infusion over the internet, i.e. no radio needed. So that's an idea. It, it, yes, it is. And it, it works beautifully. And for folks that are um, in HOAs or condos where they can't, practically can't use any kind of radio equipment for various reasons, um, you can do that. And I, I don't know if you can see this, but this is the Northwest digital version of this. This is a, a, just a standard um, USB uh, thumbstick type arrangement. It has the DVSI chip on it and some support software for the, for the COM port that it basically uh, um, uses in order to talk to the software, the Blue DV software. Um, I, I don't know what I think of this because I there's a piece of me who is a real radio guy <laughs> and, and doing DV over the internet's no different than what we're doing right now. We're doing DV and DV, <laughs> video and voice over the internet. And, and to me, uh, you know, this is, it relies on a lot of infrastructure and a lot of fancy equipment. Um, Digital voice over HF or digital voice simplex is another story. It's radio, you know. So to me, it, 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 there, there's that interest factor, and, and it's why I do what I do. <laughs> anyway, again, that's all of the questions in the chat. Do we have any hands up? You're muted, Dan. Yeah, I don't see any. Okay. Okay. Are there any comments out there? Lots of good presentations and thank yous in chat. Yes. You did a great job, job for us here, Jack. Appreciate that. And we're wrapped up in about an hour's time. This is uh, unusual. Well, I, I, I deliberately timed this and I, I ran through it figuring out what I would do. I. As, as you may have gathered from my uh, self-introduction, I uh, was an academic for a while and I've spent many a uh, hour <laughs> in front of a college class or a uh, uh, dental school class teaching. So <laughs> I used my rule of thumb. Well, it worked, worked very well. Okay, uh, any more questions out there? Do you see anything pop up in chat there, Barry? Nothing more. All righty. Well, I, I hope that everybody has a lot of fun with this, Dan. 
Uh, those of you who haven't experienced it, it, it's one of those things that, you know, a boring Saturday afternoon, you want to nail something uh, up on the wall, it's a good place to do it. By the way, Kent, KQ4KK, even has a, uh, um, a certificate that he'll give if you, uh, what is it, you get 12 states and one foreign country, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> on DHRHF, he'll, he'll give you a, he'll send you a, a certificate for the uh, effort that you've put in. Well, good to know, good to know. Okay, make a quick scan again, make sure we're not losing anybody. Um, okay, if you'll send me that presentation PDF, I'll make sure everybody gets a copy of it, have all the links and such. And uh, I'm sure that they'll, 